Okay, so now, now let's say we've got, um, for example, a low total T4, and we want to confirm hypothyroidism. We know that, that a low total T4 by itself does not confirm euthyroidism. Remember, we said a normal total T4 tends to confirm euthyroidism, but when it's low, we, we think it uh, makes for euthyroidism less likely, but it's also not confirmed either, nor is hypothyroidism. This brings us to additional tests. Free T4, and I'm going to talk mostly about the results in free, for free T4 by dialysis, measures the unbound or free fraction of hormone that generally is about one part out of a thousand in circulation in dogs and cats. Actually, it turns out that this test is the single one that, if measured alone, has the highest diagnostic sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy, but we don't recommend just measuring free T4. It tends to correlate very well with clinical status, whether it be on the hypo or the hyperthyroid side or in the, in the euthyroid basis, and we prefer that it be measured by dialysis methods. So much of the data I'm going to talk to you about will try to convince you that if you can get access to this by dialysis method, as done by major diagnostic laboratories, such as IDEX or Antec, you, this would be the best possible uh, route. Uh, Non-dialysis methods tend to be less accurate in the presence of illnesses and drugs because there are things that alter the displacement of thyroid hormone from its binding proteins. And yet, dialysis procedure can sort some of this out. So let's, let's compare what's going on in the circulation in the top left in vivo. We have th plasma binding proteins that are reversibly associated with total T4 and lead to a small fraction, one part out of a thousand generally, of free T4. This is the fraction that can then penetrate the cell membrane, lead to all the biological effects, the metabolism, it's the ideation, it's the action. So what we're trying to do on the bottom when we use a dialysis procedure is use a semipermeable membrane shown in the middle that will allow the free fraction to permeate or dialyze across that and we measure that either by a direct immunoassay or if it's radioactively labeled, we can measure it that way. But most of the time, we're looking at using a very sensitive T4 assay and measure the dialysate. Now, this is a very busy graph, uh, and I apologize for that, but I want to highlight what's down on the bottom. And this was a study done uh, 15 years ago that showed that standard equilibrium dialysis and uh, modified equilibrium dialysis, those two columns on the, on the left here and the yellow are probably the true values of equal, uh, free T4. And you'll notice that various rate amino assay procedures shown to the right all show values that are much, much lower. And this is because that there are circumstances where the free T4, uh, the the non-dialysis free T4 measurements become inaccurate, and this is when there's some displacement of thyroid hormone from the binding proteins, or there might be antibodies. And so we wanted you to be aware of this discrepancy. Always ask a lab what, they, what their particular procedure is and how it performs in context of um, thyroid hormone antibodies, thyroid uh, T4 antibodies specifically, but also in um, a non-thyroidal illness. So specifically, a uh, recent study by Randolph showed the, that, there were, that basically the non-dialysis free T4 methods were inaccurate in animals that have positive thyroid globulin autoantibodies. And, and that suggested that there may be also some alteration or pres presence of T4 autoantibodies. So they looked at, uh, they, they generally showed that there were false negative results by the chemiluminescent free T4, which is a non-dialysis procedure, and they tended to be uh, higher than uh, those in the, with equilibrium dialysis. That would mean an, a lower diagnosis of hypothyroidism than you'd expect. So 
they just said they caught the caution should be exercised in screening dogs with hypothyroidism using free T4 measured by chymoluminescent assays. And they also noted that some thyroglobin the positive hypothyroid dogs had free T4 values within the reference range. So that means that hypothyroidism would be underestimated. So what's the let's do head on head with the, the diagnostic value of a free T4 and a total T4. And you know you can see that the sensitivity and specificity are very high for free T4 compared to total T4. And these are using the same data set that we showed you before. Now let's turn to the way you really should be using these tests, and that is some index of thyroid homo thyroid gland failure, whether it be total T4 or free T4, and some index of the fact that the pituitary response is recognizing a deficiency, that would be an elevated TSH. So we're going to assume that these were the, when we say T4, it's low T4. When you say TSH, it's high TSH, for example. So TSH by itself, you, we talked about the sensitivity. Uh, it had, adds greater specificity. And you can see that on the bottom panel, by measuring T4 and TSH and free T4 and TSH, you get much higher specificity for this the diagnosis of primary hypothyroidism. And that's why we recommend the combination of either T4 and TSH or free T4 and TSH. Again, we mentioned this a study before the, that looked at risk factors for low T4, and now we're going to focus on high TSH and non-thyroidal illness. Again, about a quarter of the patients that they found of these 207 dogs with non-thyroidal illness had elevated TSH, which would suggest hypothyroidism. And the risk factors were that the male or spayed female had a greater risk factor for high TSH, an animal over 11, and a miniature dachshund. Each of these categories led to increased odds ratios for, for elevated TSH. So in summary, males, neutered females, older animals, and the miniature dachshund have a higher risk of elevated TSH during a non-thyroidal disease. Let's, let's pause here for a minute and talk about a case. And uh, this is the case of a two-and-a-half-year-old borsoi female. Problem that she presented with were itchy red ears, only one heat so far, and the owner was worried. They also diagnosed a yeast infection of the ears, and all the thyroid hormone tests, which shown below, show that T4 is, out, is below the normal range. Free T4 is just within the normal range. Uh, this is by dialysis. TSH was within the normal range. And T3 is within the normal range. And so the question is, is this animal hypothyroid? We've got to think about the diagnostic criteria we talked about. And the first thing to note is that, oh, this is a sight hound. And we want to point out that free T4 and total T4 generally are about half of what you'd expect in a, a, a patient that is otherwise euthyroid. So this animal is not hypothyroid, but just the diff what we find. And we don't really understand the difference, whether it's binding proteins or more likely or some alteration of pituitary um, feedback in this, in this breed. Now let's turn our attention to tests of thyroid autoimmunity. And these include the measurement of antithyroglobulin autoantibodies and antithyroid hormone autoantibodies, specifically anti-T4 and anti-T3 autoantibodies. And to remind you, on the left-hand panel, this is what the normal thyroid gland looks like. And when we bring in thyroiditis, we have a lot of lymphocytes coming in to destroy the gland. At the same time, they have the potential to be creating uh, antibodies against the major protein within the gland, and that is thyroglobulin. Thyroglobulin has lots of T4 and T3 hanging off of it, and so as a result, a subset of those patients with antithyroglobulin autoantibodies could have T3 or T4 autoantibodies. And we'll talk about the implication of that as we go forward. So let's start with the most common type of autoantibody, 
uh, the, a test that's actually used to test for thyroiditis itself, and that's antithyroglobulin or TG autoantibodies. These are known, the presence of TG autoantibodies is the earliest known indicator of thyroid pathology. However, a positive thyroglobulin antibody doesn't mean that the animal will always de develop hypothyroidism later, but it does, uh, and it doesn't clarify the odds for an animal to, to actually, uh, that you breed, to have offspring that are hypothyroid either. Uh, that would take some genetic testing. But we do know that uh, when you screen, want to screen for subclinical forms of thyroid failure or heritable thyroiditis, the one thing you can do is measure the things we've talked about, T4, TSH, free T4, and thyroglobulin autoantibody. And so these, these tests are actually recommended by the Orthopedic Foundation of America to screen animals to be absolutely confident that when you breed that animal, at least at that moment in time, uh, there's no evidence of the animal being hypothyroid itself. That, that, that doesn't rule out the possibility that it's passing along genes associated with hypothyroidism, but it makes it less likely. And antibodies against T4, and more commonly it turns out T3, can be found in some of the thyroglobulin positive dogs. This is, as I mentioned, because these antibodies, uh, certain epitopes, pick up this large protein in T3 hanging off of it or T4 hanging off of it. The main clinical significance of these antibodies is that it invalidates the measurement of T, total T4 or free T4 and total T3. Now, if you use the dialysis method, it doesn't invalidate the free T4 method. But if it's a total, if it's a, a non-dialysis procedure of any sort, you can be su uh, suspect about the results. Well, let's now talk about uh, some adjunct diagnostics, and one that you see being used a little bit, in, particularly in Europe, is uh, scintigraphy. And uh, as we show on the right, of an animal that is truly hypothyroid. You can see the salivary glands, the measurement of technetium uptake, behaving much like iodine, but nothing below that uh, to suggest there's thyroid tissue, as you'd see in a non-thyroidal illness patient on the left here. Um, and so, uh, basically, this study uh, demonstrated that, in fact, comparing the uh, thyroid uptake, proceed, the, the uptake of, te, of technetium in this case, um, was a useful test to determine thyroid function. However, you can have non-diagnostic and asymmetric uptake, and you can have effects on this caused by glucocorticoids that would suppress uh, technetium uptake in, in an otherwise euthyroid patient. Uh, they felt like this test was promising, but it's not yet, we need more tests need to be done to actually lead to conclusions that this could be a gold standard for establishing thyroid function. Now other adjunct diagnostics that you, uh, recent studies have shown include the measurement of uh, growth hormone following uh, TRH administration. And what they did in this study, and they tried to use thyroid scintigraphy to classify patients um, as either hypothyroid or non-thyroidal illness patients. And then they gave TRH and measured um, TSH and growth hormone at 0, 30, and 45 minutes. Now, this graphic may be hard to see, but the comp, the, what, what you uh, found, what they found was that TSH did not change after TRH in hypothyroid dogs. Now, this is important to recognize. This is totally opposite of what you'd expect in people, where the TSH following TRH is actually more robust in hypothyroid patients than it is in a euthyroid patient. In the case of dogs, it turns out that they are, it is, it is less so. So TSH didn't change in hypothyroid patients. Um, but growth hormone did and it was able to distinguish between non-thyroidal 
illness patients where growth hormone elevated and hypothyroid patients where it didn't. Um, so this is, this is an interesting observation. The problem is getting growth hormone measured reliably um, is not easy. So not many diagnostic labs are measuring growth hormone, but I thought we'd just mention it. So measurement of basal growth hormone, which also would be elevated a little bit, and the concentration of growth hormone after TRH can distinguish between hypothyroidism and non-thyroidal illness. So let's now look at a particular algorithm suggested by IDEX laboratories regarding the diagnosis of hypothyroidism in the dog. And these results that they show were based upon over 8,000 canine samples, canine patients, run uh, as part of wellness testing. And they noted that in one of seven profiles run, uh, so otherwise healthy dogs, they showed a low total T4 result, leading to a suspicion or further diagnostic testing, let's say, that needed to distinguish between hypothyroidism and, and non-thyroidal illness. So the first thing to note is what we said is if the animal's T, normal, T4 is normal, you can basically say hypothyroidism is unlikely. If the animal has clear, based on clinical presentation, various diagnostic tests, clear reduction of total T4 associated with non-thyroidal illness, then figure out what's going on with that non-thyroidal illness. This leaves us with these sort of inter these more difficult issues where you've just got a low T4 or a low normal T4, and then it suggests that we go down the pathway here to a measurement of free T4 and TSH and possibly thyroglobulin. If there's a low free T4 and a high TSH and a positive thyroglobulin, that's suggesting, suggestive of hypothyroidism on the left. And if everything's normal, hypothyroidism is less likely. Uh, if you still suspect hypothyroidism, you can wait. Uh, the animal's not gonna die of hypothyroidism and you can retest in four to six weeks.